<clears throat> now let's talk about respiratory alkalosis. And I'm actually going to erase some of this so that I can use this cell as an example. Awesome. Again, if you have any questions as you go through this, please, please, please let me know. All right. So <clears throat> next thing up, respiratory alkalosis. Okay. This takes a little bit of time to explain. When you have alkalosis, okay, let's write that down somewhere. Alkalosis. Sounds a lot like the word alkaline, which means basic, okay? Which means you have a high pH, which otherwise means that you are low acidity level in your blood, which also means if you have low acidity, you have low hydrogen ions, okay? And that's the issue. A lot of the times you have low hydrogen ions in your bloodstream. Okay, what that does is it raises your blood pH too high and you experience what's called alkalosis. If you have questions on this, please watch my acids and bases video. It's a really important one that you understand. We know, okay, that in your bloodstream, we need to keep the pH around 7.35 to 7.45 in pH. Okay, that's slightly basic. But in alkalosis, we'll say that it goes to something like 7.6. That's dangerous, okay? Because enzymes don't function properly that way, a whole list of things, okay? So why, why is this happening and how can we fix it? Very extensive answer to that question. Let's keep rolling. So I told you <clears throat> that uh, it, alkalosis occurs when we have low hydrogen ions. It can also occur if we have high amounts of bicarbonate, HCO3 minus, okay? Bicarbonate acts as a buffer, basically takes away some of the hydrogen ions and makes your blood more alkaline, okay? So what's happening here? Well, let's step back a little bit <clears throat> and figure out why it's happening as well as how we can treat it. So first off, in your uh, cells, let's start there, in your cells, we need to be making ATP, right? So we're going to be doing this equation a lot. Glucose, so we're basically bringing in glucose from our food. We're adding it to a lot of oxygen, okay? And we're going to be producing a lot of ATP, something like 32 to 36 ATP that will power those sodium potassium pumps. We're also going to produce a lot of water, okay? So it's about six water. And we're also going to produce six carbon dioxide, okay? Well, if you've watched any sort of a buffer videos, you have heard of <clears throat> an enzyme called carbonic anhydrase. Carbonic anhydrase can actually take these molecules of water and carbon dioxide and produce an acid, H2CO3, which is called carbonic acid. Okay, carbonic acid. Well, you know that an acid produces hydrogen ions, yes? Well, with the help of carbonic anhydrase, the enzyme in your cells, you can produce from this hydrogen ions and bicarbonate, HCO3 minus, all right? So we're producing hydrogen ions and we're also producing bicarbonate. Okay, now check this out. <clears throat> with this, what usually happens is we have bicarbonate that's going to be usually symported out, okay, through some sort of symport back into the bloodstream, HCO3 minus, okay? Usually with potassium, I believe, or sodium, some sort of symport that's bringing it out. Uh, actually, uh, check me on that, that's potassium symports, it's bringing bicarbonate out. There could also be antiports with sodium bringing, being brought in and bicarbonate being kicked out. Um, I'm not for sure, so check on me for that. So that bicarbonate makes its way into the bloodstream, <clears throat> okay? Now, think back. If we have high amounts of bicarbonate, in the, in the bloodstream, right, we're going to make the blood more basic, okay? This is gonna be a problem here in a second. So, let's follow this here in a second. This hydrogen ion can actually go to this, what's called an antiport. This is going to be a sodium hydrogen antiport. Sodium hydrogen antiport, what does that mean? Well, <clears throat> We know that sodium is really high outside the cell, right? So sodium is going to actually be brought in to the cell and we're going to kick hydrogen out of the cell. Yes. 
So now we've got hydrogen being kicked out of the cell, sodium being kicked into the cell, and bicarbonate going into the bloodstream. Okay, now, this makes your pee, your urine, a little more acidic, okay? And that's normal, all right? But remember, with alkalosis, what we want to do is prevent this bicarbonate from getting back into the bloodstream, because if it continues to get into the bloodstream, right, our pH will go up. So pH will go up, and that's the problem, right? So when you are climbing a mountain and your blood becomes too alkaline, it's raising too much, you don't want this process to occur. You don't want bicarbonate to go back in the bloodstream because then your pH will rise and rise and rise even further, all right? And that's bad. So the question is, how do we stop bicarbonate from being reabsorbed into the bloodstream? You may say, well... Let's just stop this reaction, right? Let's stop glucose and oxygen, make an ATP and all that stuff, because then all this stuff downstream will happen, right? Eh, probably not the best idea, because if we stop this process, we have no ATP. If we have no ATP, cells die. So instead, you can take what's called a carbonic anhydrase inhibitor. <clears throat> okay, I'm going to write that up here. You can take a drug that's called a carbonic anhydrase inhibitor. Okay, what the heck is a carbonic anhydrase again? What was the enzyme that helped basically convert all this stuff? It was actually here too. Carbonic anhydrase is used for both reactions, okay? <clears throat> Mostly here though, I, I should say, so we'll primarily focus on that, okay? So carbonic anhydrase transformed water and carbon dioxide into this acid. If we inhibit it, we don't produce this acid, do we? Okay. If we don't produce that acid, we don't produce bicarbonate. So bicarbonate stops being reabsorbed. Okay, now, this one's interesting. So if we stop bicarbonate from being reabsorbed, that's a good thing, right? Because now we're not throwing a bunch of buffer back into our bloodstream. What happens to our pH? Our pH will drop. So pH drops which was good in this case, right? If it was like 7.6, we wanted to bring it down to like 7.4. Now, what will also happen though, is hydrogen ions won't be produced, yeah? So if hydrogen ions aren't produced, well, this symport won't be working. If this symport isn't working, where will sodium remain? Tough question. So if we block this process, block acids from being produced, block this antiport essentially, sodium will stay in the tubule, won't it? So sodium will now remain in the tubule and continue down the path. Well, if we keep a lot of sodium in the tubule, what else will stay in the tubule? Water, because this is a solute, right? So if we keep solute in the tubule, we keep water in the tubule. And if we keep water in the tubule, where will these things end up? As urine. So if you ever take a carbonic anhydrase inhibitor, you will have to pee pretty frequently, okay? If you've climbed a mountain before and you've had this alkalosis and you take this, uh, this what's called diuretic, it makes you pee more, you're doing it basically to lower your blood pH, but a symptom of that is you urinate a lot. Now, and this is one last application to carbonic anhydrase inhibitors. So we've gone through basically everything I want to. I just want to extend it a little bit. If you use a carbonic anhydrase inhibitor, <clears throat> you are peeing out more fluid. If you're peeing out more fluid, right, less is being reabsorbed. So your blood volume will also drop. So your blood volume also drops. Because basically all that filtrate that was pushed out from the bloodstream is staying in there and you're peeing out more. So therefore the stuff being reclaimed has decreased blood volume drops. Well, that's really helpful if you have hypertension, if you have high blood pressure, right? So carbonic anhydrase inhibitor, since it drops your blood volume, it is a blood pressure medication. Because if your blood volume drops, you have a decrease in blood pressure. So this is a drug for hypertension, high blood pressure. 
So if you ask any of your friends if they have high blood pressure and they take a carbonic anhydrase inhibitor to basically may, uh, lower their blood pressure, most of the time they're going to the bathroom pretty frequently, okay? So really, really uh, intricate stuff here. Hopefully this was helpful. So once again, just to recap, we went through the proximal convoluted tubule, the first part of that nephron. We talked about how it reabsorbs a lot of different solutes, things like glucose, amino acids. In fact, I believe something like 80% of like glucose, amino acids, and other beneficial uh, solutes are reabsorbed at the PCT. So that's really important. Furthermore, we talked about how we establish that concentration gradient with the sodium potassium pump. So we have high sodium to play with, high potassium inside the cell to play with, and that powers different gradients, right, for these symports here and here, as well as an antiport here, right? We talked about how glucose symporters are only found in the proximal convoluted tubule. So if you have diabetes and you have a lot of blood glucose, okay, it'll stay in that tubule after the PCT and you'll pee out a lot of glucose because water follows that solute glucose. Lastly, we talked about this sodium hydrogen antiport and how it can basically pull hydrogen into the tubule, sodium into the cell, because we produce this acid from cell respiration, okay? And that reabsorbs bicarbonate. Now, if it reabsorbs bicarbonate, our pH and our blood will go up. That could be dangerous. So we can take carbonic anhydrase inhibitors to block this whole process, block this antiport, block hydrogen or bicarbonate from being reabsorbed. So you'll pee a lot, sodium and water will stay in the tubule, but you are decreasing your pH because you're not reabsorbing that bicarbonate ion as often. Awesome. It's also a drug for hypertension because it lowers your blood pressure by lowering blood volume. One of the more complicated processes here. So if you have any questions, please drop comments below. Like this video, subscribe if this is helpful, and please let me know if there's a specific thing you'd like me to go through so that I can help you learn a little better. Thanks for watching.